The Zika virus is a new virus. It's been around, it was first identified in about 1947 in a forest deep in the center of Africa. Uh, slowly, it has made its way westward, but it is really very new to the Western Hemisphere. The virus is spread by mosquitoes, but not all mosquitoes. Currently, we know that it's spread by the Aedes aegypti mosquito, which is common throughout Central America and South America, but it's also found in parts of the United States, in particular Florida, the Gulf Coast, and Texas. Now, there are other mosquitoes, the Aedes albopictus, which is another Aedes uh, family member mosquito, which is also found uh, in Texas and throughout, actually throughout a lot of the southern United States, that might be able to transmit the virus, but we're not sure about that yet. One of the things about this virus is that it's relatively new, and so a lot is not known about it. And then keep in mind that certainly in Texas and in Houston in particular, there are many, many different species of mosquitoes. But right now, these are the only two species that we're worried about. It appears the virus can be transmitted sexually. There are three cases going back to about 2008 where researchers have identified the possibility that the virus was transmitted through sexual partners. Uh, more recently, we've been hearing about a case in Dallas where a traveler uh, returned from one of the countries where the virus is being transmitted and passed it on to his sexual partner. So that one's being investigated now, but it, it appears that if it's transmitted sexually, it's probably not real easy, or otherwise we would have had many more cases. But one of the things about the virus being new is we're still learning a lot about it. We're really not certain how the Zika virus may cause brain damage in infants. In fact, we're not even certain that it's the Zika virus that's responsible for the brain damage that's being seen. The particular problem we're talking about is called microcephaly, where the baby has an abnormally small brain. Uh, research is ongoing. Uh, it is unclear if it's really the Zika virus. Remember, there are other things which can cause microcephaly. We know that there are other viruses that can cause microcephaly. We know that there are certain toxins that people can be exposed to can cause microcephaly. Uh, German measles uh, can cause microcephaly. And so uh, we're not exactly sure. Again, it's early. Uh, the virus has only really been on the scientific radar for about a year now, so it's going to take some time to figure this out. Microcephaly is a condition where as the fetus is developing, the skull actually closes too early and the brain itself doesn't form the way it should. And so children are born with abnormally small skulls, small heads, and the brain is underdeveloped. It can be devastating to the child. It is uh, one of the most devastating things that could happen in pregnancy. The countries that pregnant women should avoid are countries in Central and South America and the Caribbean. Now, this is a changing list. So currently, there are about 26 different countries on that list. But as time goes on, more countries may be added. And in fact, some countries may be taken off the list. So you should always check the CDC website to know for sure. So there is a test to find out if you've been infected with the Zika virus. Unfortunately, it is of limited availability right now. Uh, again, with it being a new virus, the ability to do these tests is just ramping up now. So it's being reserved for people for whom we really need to know whether or not they've been infected with the Zika virus. And then right now we're predominantly focusing on pregnant women. If you're pregnant and you recently traveled to a country with Zika virus, you should contact your healthcare provider and have a discussion with them about what to look, watch for, what signs and symptoms to watch for, and whether or not you should be tested. There's a little bit of controversy just yet as to who should be tested, and that has to do with the fact that the virus is still so new to us. So you need to check with your healthcare provider and find out how to manage your situation from now until the end of the pregnancy. If you're currently not pregnant and you're planning on traveling to one of the affected countries, you should check with your pr primary care physician about what precautions you may want to take while you're traveling. What they're likely going to tell you is to use strict contraceptive uh, techniques if you don't want to become pregnant. And they're also going to give you a lot of advice about how to protect yourself from becoming infected while you're there.
If you're currently pregnant and you previously traveled to one of the affected countries, it probably won't be an issue. We do know that if people become infected with the Zika virus and they get over it, they get well, that that does not put any subsequent pregnancies at any increased risk of problems. But if you're pregnant now and you did travel, you may want to check with your primary care physician or your OBGYN. If you've just returned from one of the affected countries and you're worried that you may have become infected, one of the things that we do know is that uh, about 80% of the people who get infected don't have any symptoms. So you're at risk for having the illness and potentially being able to spread it for at least two to three weeks. So during that time, we ask you to wear long sleeves, long pants, use plenty of DEET, and do everything you can to prevent yourself be from being bitten by a mosquito locally. Because that mosquito, if it gets the virus from your blood, could then transmit it to somebody else. In terms of when in the pregnancy it's the greatest risk for injury to the fetus, we don't exactly know. But based on what we know from other fetal infectious uh, complications, the earlier on in the pregnancy is probably a greater risk. But at this point, we simply don't know. At this point, no, there is no treatment for the Zika virus. When people do become symptomatic with an infection, they generally will have fever, body aches, and a rash, which can all be treated with your usual home remedies. People need a rest. They need to take care of themselves, but probably most importantly, they need to wear long sleeves and long pants and use plenty of insect repellent because certainly while they're symptomatic, we do believe that that is a point where they're at high risk for transmitting it to a mosquito if bitten. No, there is no vaccine. In fact, we think it'll take probably at least two years for an experimental vaccine to become available, and it may take up to five years after that before it'll be widely available. So in the meantime, the goal is to not get infected in the first place by using uh, the long sleeves, the long pants, use plenty of insect repellent. Make sure that your home is in good repair, or if you go and you travel uh, to one of the affected countries, try to stay in some place that has air conditioning. Um, there maybe there'll be mosquito netting. You're gonna have to assess the situation while you're there, but do everything you can to not become infected by a mosquito bite. We believe the reason that the link to microcephaly was never suspected earlier is because the outbreaks that occurred in Africa and as it moved eastward around the globe were in countries where there are many similar viruses and so many of the people may have had some immunity already. It wasn't until it got into French Polynesia uh, just a few years ago where there was an increase of Guillain-Barre syndrome at the same time that the Zika virus outbreak occurred, beginning to the, the concern that there was a link between Zika outbreak and some other infections. And then it was just in May of last year, barely uh, eight months ago, when the virus was found in, uh, in mosquitoes in Brazil. Because there's basically no immunity in the Western Hemisphere to people from Zika virus or similar viruses, it was able to spread very rapidly. Very many people became ill with it. And this is when we first saw the complications. And there were some significant complications. The microcephaly, obviously, but the, in one area in Brazil, where there's about nine or 10 million people, the number of cases of microcephaly that were occurring otherwise is very low. There's only about nine cases. In the last year, there've been over 670 cases. And so with the Zika virus spreading so rapidly and all of a sudden this increase in the microcephaly cases, that's why we assume that there's a link. Now that link has not yet been proven, but researchers are furiously trying to figure out if that is in fact the case. But this is why we think that it was so quiet until just recently. This is the first time it has, the virus has gotten to a densely populated area with many, many people. And it also happens to be an area where there's probably no immunity amongst the people who live there. No, the Zika outbreak has not been linked to microcephaly outside of Brazil, but in French Polynesia, it was linked to an increase in Guillain-Barre syndrome. Guillain-Barre syndrome is another potentially devastating neurologic illness where basically anybody can uh, develop it. And essentially what happens is that the immune system is somehow fooled and it reacts against your own nervous system. 
People get a paralysis and most people, or at least many people, will wind up so paralyzed that they may have to be in the intensive care unit on a ventilator. Again, most people will actually get over this and they will return to their uh, normal lifestyles. But we do know that about 30% of people will wind up with some degree of permanent neurologic uh, uh, disorder as a result of Guillain-Barre syndrome. So this is also a very serious potential complication of Zika virus, which has not yet been proven, but the numbers suggest that there is a linkage. The Zika virus is not endemic to this area yet of Texas, but we anticipate that it certainly could be. There are a number of things that we as Houstonians need to do to protect ourselves. First of all, we need to eliminate the places where the, uh, the mosquitoes, the Aedes aegypti mosquito, can breed. So that is basically any amount of standing water. As little as a bottle cap can be a breeding source for the aegypti, uh, Aedes aegypti mosquito. Therefore, we need to make sure that we don't have any used tires that have got collections of water, pots, pans, cups, saucers, uh, dog water dishes need to be uh, changed out frequently. Your rain gutters need to be cleaned out so that there isn't any standing rainwater in the gutters. We need to do everything we can to make sure there's no standing water in places for the Aedes aegypti mosquito to breed. The second thing we need to do is understand that Aedes aegypti mosquito feeds primarily on humans. So we're its food source. That's why you're gonna find it around your home. Therefore, the other thing we need to do is make sure that we protect ourselves from being bitten. So we wear the long sleeves, the long pants, wear plenty of DEET when we're outdoors, and then we also have to make sure that our homes are in good repair. Make sure that the screens are intact. There's no tears in the screen. Make sure that the window fits into the window frame. Make sure that the door fits into the door frame properly. And that there's no gaps, no way for a mosquito to get into your house. They like living in people's homes. You wouldn't uh, expect that, but every once in a while you see a mosquito in your house, it's probably an 80s Egypti mosquito. They also live around your doors and the windows trying to get in. So we need to keep our homes in good repair, eliminate all the standing water, and eliminate something for them to eat, which is us. So wear the DEET, wear the long clothes, and be vigilant about making sure that we don't drop our guard. This is not a sprint, this is a marathon. We need to do this all summer long.